All right, everyone. Um, my name is Elizabeth Zelli. Thank you for coming to my awesome talk about surveys. Uh, we'll give everyone a few minutes to come in. Um, but yeah, basically, this is kind of intended for um, the foundational track. So if you have written many surveys, some of this might not be most useful to you. But in general, I'm hoping to give everyone kind of a broad overview of how I personally approach doing that kind of final last pass on my surveys to make sure before I send them out, are we good? And what I will be using for is examples in this particular presentation is surveys that have been released into the wild. Every screenshot you're going to see today is from surveys that people published and went onto the internet. Um, so we're gonna have some fun with that. And yes, all of the surveys you see are going to be real. Um, I do apologize for some potato quality screenshots on some of these occasions, um, but I think that we will all be able to understand the, hopefully, the flaws in these survey questions. So, first of all, who am I? I'm Elizabeth Zelli. I'm a researcher at Bethesda Softworks. So we are the publishing arm of Bethesda. Our research lab basically services any product that goes, comes out of Bethesda Publishing. Um, I have about 10 years of experience in the industry as a whole, seven doing user research. I've been at Bethesda for a year and a half. And you can find me for more of this kind of quality content on Twitter, because this has actually started as a common Twitter thing I would do, is I would roast bad survey questions, post a screenshot, say, here are things that you can learn to not do in your surveys. And basically, once I started doing that and people seemed to like it on Twitter, I took the bold stance of taking every survey that I got sent. It's fun, let me tell you. Um, I highly advise it, actually. If you're trying to like, you know, make your own survey game a little stronger, you would be amazed at how many surveys you are actually being sent or offered on websites and stuff. Take them. You might find bad surveys. You probably will find bad surveys. Um, learn from them what not to do, which is kind of the point of this presentation. Or you might find really great survey questions that you can borrow and use in your own surveys. Because I'm not going to be the person to come up with the best wording for every survey question possible. If someone else already did a better one, I will happily steal it and use it in my next one. So the kind of foundational framework I'm coming at is this quote. A survey is a special type of conversation. Uh, when you're doing interviews or group discussions or things like that, it's really easy to keep in mind that that is another human being and that basic social skills come into play when doing research. I think we sometimes lose focus of that when we're doing surveys because we're not sitting in front of the participant watching the way our survey questions impact them. But it is still a conversation. And so kind of the goal is I'm trying to hope to hope you take away is to think about the surveys you write as conversations that you are having at a delay with your participants. And social skills are still extremely important even when writing your survey questions. And basically, there's the big oops. You write a bad survey question. It goes out into the wild. Every single one of the surveys you're going to see today was written by someone who is a professional, probably getting paid more than you are, who released it into the wild. Do not worry if you make a mistake too. Um, it's extremely common, all the way up to if you're a senior, you'll still make mistakes. The important thing about mistakes is to use them as learning opportunities. Learn to recognize when there's flaws in survey questions and what you can try and learn to avoid to do the next time. And so hopefully by roasting other people's survey questions, you can kind of get an idea, a head start on that. So, lesson number one, your survey questions need to be respectful. Try not to make your user feel insulted or uncomfortable or overlooked by the way you write your surveys. Here's a great example. Take a look at this question. Was your household income in one of these buckets last year? Which bucket would you pick and how does that option make you feel? Now, I've seen the salary survey data, so I know most of us are having to select bottom bucket there. How does it feel to have to be, pick the lowest income bracket on a survey? Yay, I'm poor. <laughs> so think about the way, the, way you know, the question options you're offering are going to make someone emotionally respond to your question. So there we go. 
Users don't want to be in the lowest income bracket. Surprise. Forcing them to choose it is what I like to call a feel bad. <laughs> it's the opposite of a warm fuzzy. It's a cold prickly. No one likes to feel bad when they're taking a survey. And you might also be tipping your hand that they're not your target demo. And if you're making them feel excluded or like they're not your target demo, then you get a lot of, well, what's the point of me taking this survey? What's the point of me providing useful feedback? They might churn out of your survey. They might start giving you garbage data. You have all sorts of problems you've now created just by the way you created your answer options. And oh, by the way, this is a survey I was personally sent. I was insulted. Um, as a suggestion, like how could you approach this differently? Rework the question. Have at least one more bracket, a bucket under the 100K threshold. You know, it's a simple solution that you could offer. And I understand immediately what this researcher is doing. I am not that researcher's target demo when I filled out this survey. But I didn't need to know that as a survey taker. If you honestly don't care and you just want to group everyone under 100K into the same bucket, do that on the back end. Do that with how you code your answers. Do that in analysis. Don't let your survey participant feel like they aren't someone that you wanted taking your survey to begin with. So here's another one. Let's see. Let's ask about your sexual orientation. Are you straight or heterosexual? Do you not understand the question? Do you prefer to discuss that with your doctor? Do you prefer not to answer or more options. <laughs> and like they even have a space for a sixth group there. Like they didn't even need to limit it to five options. But obviously your LGBTQ participants might feel a little overlooked or excluded. Even if you could click more options and get to it, they still are hidden under the fold. They don't feel like they are a default option on your survey. And so just at the very beginning, if you started your questionnaire off with this, you're going to make people feel like they're excluded. You're making them feel bad. Don't make people feel bad when taking your survey. So basically the takeaway is just be respectful. Try to think really empathetically about how your question is going to impact a variety of different groups of people. Avoid othering your participants with the questions and answers that you're offering them. You know, we've all been in conversations with people who totally like are not into it. They're just kind of patronizing maybe a little. You know, we know what it feels like to not be respected in a conversation and try not to do it to your participants within your survey framework either. So next lesson, your survey should not feel like work. Respect your participants' time and energy that they are putting into the survey if you, you've designed. So here's a great screenshot. And this is cutting off a number of options continuing further down. I, this is a fun one. So um, you're supposed to be doing a nice, you know, which one do you agree with more, statement A or statement B? But the way it's presented is a lot of text. You might say a wall of text with tiny little text boxes where they get to manually enter their options on a scale of one to 11. So there's a lot going on here that we could kind of dig into. <laughs> there's a lot going wrong. But this survey, this answering this question is work. The participant is having to do a lot. They have to read each you know, statement. They have to, instead of having a visual breakdown for them to help them kind of come up with their gradation, they're having to mentally carry like the difference between the two ends. So you're adding cognitive load. You're giving them a very weird scale of one to 11 that they're trying to kind of have to mentally parse. And once again, you don't have a visual helping, you know, guide to help them understand the scale you've created. Plus, there's just so many on a single page, it becomes immediately overwhelming. I don't even want to answer number one, let alone answer number 12. So, and basically, people will dip out of your survey right here. They're like, I have no interest in whatever else this survey is going to be asking me because I don't have the time for that. So one, I mentioned a visual scale. It can be really helpful to your participants to lessen the load on them mentally, to just give them the visual differentiation. Give them some radio buttons horizontally, give them a sliding little bar. You know, there's a lot modern survey tools can offer you. It can be really helpful to your participants to not have to think, well, is that a seven or an eight on this one to 11 scale that I feel? Just let them kind of visually come up with it. 
uh, have fewer statements or dear God, at least fewer statements per page. If you really, really have to ask this many different statements in your questions, at least break it up so that a, par a participant isn't overwhelmed visually. You know, we've all been in those conversations where we have to do all the work to carry the conversation and we're like, why am I continuing to talk to this human being if they won't do the basics of like asking me questions or showing interest in my life? You can make your survey participants feel that way as well. And you may be like, well, these are all really important things for me to know. Well, that's great, but you need to divide, you know, divide your survey at least a little bit in that case to make sure you're not overwhelming them in a moment. And yeah, just go for a zero to 10 scale. I don't know why you would make your max 11. This isn't Spinal Tap. Like, <laughs> it's a little crazy. <laughs> so here's another survey. This is a screenshot from a desktop browser on full Zoom, like, and that is how tiny the text was on their descriptions. It was literally illegible. Um, you had to like zoom in in order to read the additional text that they had provided in this. Um, also, they had a zero to 100 scale on this particular slider bar. Slider bar, great, that's exactly what I was recommending on the previous slide. But zero to 100 is probably overkill. I don't think that knowing that your participants feel a 68 on this particular scale is going to be significantly more valid. Um, and it takes a lot more work then for them to kind of parse mentally, well, do I feel like a 68 or a 67? You're wasting your cognitive energy from your participant. You probably have stuff you would rather them pay attention to than kind of those fine-tuned differences. And so basically, once again, your participant is going to have to do extra work in order to answer these questions. They're probably going to have to like zoom in to expand the text. They can even read what's being said under fixed bill. And then you're making them do the extra work of figuring out where on a zero to 100 point scale they land. So yeah, one of my suggestions, it's pretty universal, but always preview your surveys. Preview them in multiple different ways, mobile and desktop. Try different browsers even, especially if you're going out to a large sample. Um, you can be amazed at the problems that, well, it looked fine in my survey tool. And then when you actually send it out to participants, this is what they're getting. Um, so it can really save you and your participants a lot of heartbreak, basically, by just previewing it you know, and be like, hey, gut check, does this still look okay? And I would recommend keeping your answer options relatively simple, really in the kind of work we're doing, do we need that kind of granularity of a zero to 100 scale? And we may be like, well, I'd really like to know, but what, how much of their energy and time are you wasting by forcing them? And then what is your gain? If you're actually going to have a return on investment for making people answer a zero to 100 scale, go for it. But I really doubt that most of the questions we need to ask are going to need that. And so simplify, streamline, keep things simple, and respect your user's time. So yeah, basic takeaway there, minimize effort. Account for how much work your questions are going to be asking your participants to do. And just simplify your survey wherever possible. And once again, just think about it. You're having a conversation. You don't want people to feel like it's work to maintain a conversation with you. You want them to feel like it's natural and easy and just kind of rolls off the tongue, even though there's no actual tongues involved in surveys where there shouldn't be. So lesson three. Once again, this kind of seems like a gimme, but confusion is bad. Confused participants are going to start giving you bad data. So double check your survey questions. And this is especially common because we know exactly what we're trying to ask. We know exactly what our intentions are and what our research goals are. And we may think we have the perfect question designed to get to our research goals but we are blind to the other interpretations that other users might have to the same question and the same words that we've chosen. So we're not gonna discuss whether or not the NPS is valid, but we will discuss how this was presented on this. I understand this is like a, hey, let's make it mobile device friendly, um, but we still have problems. Uh, <laughs> Using standardized formats and ways of presenting information will ease your participants. Most likely it's not the first time they've had to rate something on like a 10 point scale, but having this kind of distribution on the screen 
that will be confusing to your participants. I doubt that many people are actually going to end up picking any of the values in the center because the 10 and the one and the zero stand out so much from the rest of that data set. And so just immediately, this is visually confusing and knowing what is the scale, where is it going, which direction is positive or negative, it's all kind of lost. Um, so this is a confusing question. And I would recommend just kind of keep it simple, keep it standardized. Yeah, it's like it'll reduce the load on your participants every time they have to take one of these. Here's a really great one. I got this one personally. <laughs> so um, what is the difference between critical, urgent, and emergency? I honestly don't know, and I had to fill this out. Uh, so this is a great example, once again, of preview surveys run it past someone else, get a gut check from someone else, um, but simplify your choices. You may feel like, well, more choices will allow people to really pick the one that represents what they feel. Well, you're gonna end up with confusion. Um, if you have overlap between your choices, like we clearly have in this one, um, that's gonna cause confusion. This, and I would also recommend at least, bare minimum, arrange them in, scale, in order of criticality. Um, that would have at least helped me as a user understand, well, I have something on the high end of the scale and I don't know the difference between critical, urgent, and emergency, but they're at least all lumped up at that end. Maybe I can by other means understand what is intended here. But in this case, like this is just a jumbled mess. I don't know what kind of value they're going to get from surveys like this or questions like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, on your scale of no to very, where are your participants supposed to land? What is the ideal answer for you as a researcher? Um, I don't know. Yeah, a seven, clearly. Um, so just once again, if a person can't understand what it is that you're asking, they're going to feel confused. And confusion is going to make people doubt themselves. They don't know what the survey wants. You know, they just might start just inputting garbage data because they have no idea what they're supposed to do. They might leave it blank. They might just leave your survey. And these are all really extreme examples of confusion, but do keep in mind that confusion can happen in a lot of different places. Um, and I'm using the extreme examples for the humorous effect. Um, but it's a, it's someone put this survey out. Someone wanted data, they wanted feedback about their product and are getting nothing of any value because their scale is a five point no to vary. Um, and then I just took a screenshot and dipped out of the survey at this point because I'm like, I don't know what you want from me. So be precise. Precision in the way you write your surveys and is going to be really great. Um, Use survey for formats that your participants have likely seen before. That'll really simplify things. It's something they know. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. Just go with it. Um, and standardize your survey internally wherever you can. So that if you're asking the same kind of question over and over, don't like change up things a lot because you're going to end up with some messy data. And then kind of the last lesson that I'm going to give for this talk is give people an out. Feeling trapped in a survey is no fun. I mentioned earlier about kind of tipping your hand about who's your target demo. We all usually, when sending surveys, we have an intended audience that they're going to. We know who we're trying to get feedback from. But we need to account for the fact that that survey might land on someone who's not our target demo. How well do our questions and answers account for those people getting a hold of our survey? So I was given this one, this was the first question in the survey, as a buyer of kids' shirts. There's a huge assumption built into that question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't buy kids' shirts, I have no children, I am not child-sized, I have no reason to purchase kids' shirts. The survey didn't have an option for, I do not purchase children's shirts. Um, and this was like a situation where I literally gave them garbage data because I just wanted to get through. This is one of those, oh, in order to read our article, you have to answer a survey question. And this is what I was given. Okay. And I was like, I don't know. Let's go for those kind of sporty ones on the end. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's like, keep in mind that 
if I am stuck with this survey question and I am not target demo, I am given zero outs by the question. I don't want to ruin your data set, random researcher. I would like to help you out, but I can't because I have no way of telling you that I am, do not meet the needs of this question. Um, so this is my suggestion, a simple NA. Like, not applicable, prefer not to answer. There's lots of great ones out there. I do not buy children's shirts. You can make it even much more specific to the question you're asking. Um, but make sure you're basically always leaving it out just in case some random off demo person gets into your survey. This survey had no submit button. I was literally trapped in this survey. I, I, I actually was like, you can, I was filling it out. And I was like, okay, yeah, because I fill out every survey I'm sent. And I got to the end and I'm like, I am stuck. I have no way of giving you my data. So this one kind of spins back around to preview your surveys, make sure they function as intended. Um, this one obviously isn't so much like how you write your question because the questions were fine. Um, but I was trapped in their survey and unable to leave. And it was not a feel good moment to be trapped in this survey. So yeah, always leaving out. It's super hard to predict all of the different types of people that may end up taking your survey. Trapping people inside of a survey is going to significantly decrease the reliability of the data that you're collecting. So always make sure that you're like, who is the most extreme example of an off demo person that might end up in my survey? Especially when you start sending surveys out really widely online. This is when become, this one becomes really critical. But anytime, you know, I might be recruiting for a play test where my intention was to get people only familiar with Franchise X. But when I ask them a question of which games from Franchise X are you familiar with, I always leave a, I have never played a game from Franchise X. Even if I'm like, well, if I did my job right, everyone in my study should have played this franchise. I always leave an out. You never know who might slip into your study. And then that's a data point you want to have. I don't want that person lying and saying, oh, well, I played the third game. That's not going to actually help my data. It's going to make it messy. I want the honest answer. Um, a great example of honest answers is Jordan and I wrote a survey for Evolution, a census survey for Volition fans. And we asked the question of, okay, you said earlier you played these different titles from Volition. We asked them the question, how did you acquire them? And we had an option. I'll be honest, I pirated the shit out of this game. <laughs> and that was actually how we phrased it. Totally released that into the wild. And we got honest feedback by acknowledging that there were going to be people taking our survey who pirated our games, but still identified as a fan of our franchises or our studio. We were giving them an honest answer, which helped our data remain clean. We actually got some really fascinating feedback by like breaking out the pirates and seeing what they had to say about their impressions of Volition as a studio. And we got lots of, you know, oh, I'm really sorry, but I pirated Saints Row 3 because I was poor, but then I bought Saints Row 5 because I, you know, 4, sorry. There is no Saints Row 5. Um. <laughs> 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 but, um, but yeah, and I'm like, we, were, we gave them the out. We're like, please, you know, if you pirated my game, be honest, I'm okay. And we also made the answer humorous. It's a great, humor can be great in surveys if you want to break tension or increase honesty from people who might not be inclined to be honest, like video game pirates. But we were surprised. It worked. Like people admitted to us in a survey that they pirated our games. Cool. <laughs> So the kind of in summary, like what the main takeaways from this would be is that one, your participants are people. It's really easy to feel distanced from participants when using survey methodology. You're not standing there in front of them. You don't get to see their face react to the questions you ask. Also, especially when surveys have really large sample sizes, it's really easy to just kind of see them as the data instead of the individual participants that you surveyed. But we can't forget that they are humans and they have emotions. And our surveys, the way we write them and the way we write our options can impact their emotional state. And the more we're impacting their emotional state, the more it can impact the data that we're getting from them. Two, surveys are just their conversations. Think about the impact your survey question has on a participant. Think about how you feel when talking to people and think about how those kinds of questions make people feel. And then finally, 
Good survey social skills are going to improve the quality of the data that you're collecting. If you make your participants feel happy and they're useful and they're included and I feel valued because you acknowledge that people making less than 100K a year exist, then that will increase the quality of the data that you're collecting. And so overall, you're going to be improving the studies that you're doing by just kind of taking this final step back at the end of the process and going through not, oh, are all my scales accurate and is my survey logic you know, screwed up in any way, but then think how do these survey questions make people feel when they encounter them. So I wanted to end on like some recommended readings. If you are a person who's like, I want to know a lot more, a lot more about how to write surveys. So I would start off with at the top, designing quality survey questions is a great resource. It's pretty short, only like 150 pages, just came out last year. It's a really accessible place without jumping straight to like textbook level um, book. If anyone's interested, I highly recommend it. I added it to my personal kind of user research library at work. If you want the actual textbook that classes are taught from, a great resource is the Internet Phone Mail and Mixed Mode Surveys. Um, so yeah, it is really, really in-depth. If that's what you're looking for and your understanding of survey technique and methodologies, it's a great place to go. Um, Oldie but a goodie, and I say that because it's out of print, unfortunately. It's from 96, but it's actually still pretty valuable. That quote at the beginning about surveys are a special kind of conversation comes from this book, and that's thinking about answers. And so it's another great, if you can track one down, there's a ton of used copies on the market for pretty cheap. It's actually a great reference uh, as well. So yeah, that is the end of my talk. And so does anyone have any questions? <laughs> Yeah. We got some over here, yeah. Oh, thank you. Okay. Okay, we'll go Fight for questions. Um, something kind of in a similar vein to this. Um, yeah. like when you've gone through and you've polished everything and made sure you know, like things look good. I've actually pressed the preview button on my survey, and it doesn't look like a dumpster fire. Um, for kind of making sure that participants aren't going to try and game your survey and like pick the answer that they want to hear. What are some of like the tips and tricks that you've developed to kind of mitigate some of that? Um, that's a great question. Uh, you know, survey participants trying to be like, well, I know what you want from me is really definitely common. Um, a big part of that is hide your intentions as much as possible. Um, I made a comment earlier about tipping your hand about who your target demo is. And that's a great example. Um, you know, and a lot of that is in don't reveal what it is that you're actually probing on. Uh, try and av avoid mentioning specifically what it is that you want. I like to use like bury things in a matrix. Like I actually don't care about these six other things, but this one thing I buried in the middle and then randomize and yay. Um, that can actually be another good trick as well. Um, it's definitely one of the harder lessons to learn when starting to write surveys because especially if you're working to, with development teams, they can often come to you with, here's the question I want you to ask. And it's usually not great in its wording um, because they don't have the you know, resources like we do to sit in you know, fantastic you know, slideshow presentations and learning about the, you know, the finesse of writing survey questions. Um, but yeah, it's just basically be very careful to never to come right out and say, this is what I want you to tell me about. And, you know, the obvious like, don't use leading language. Tell me about that awesome game of mine you just played. Um, try to make sure that you account for all of the possible reactions a person might have. You know, always make sure I have a the none of aboves, the NAs, um, so that people aren't as likely to give you false information in that way. And then I think like the technique that worked has worked really well for me is just come at it from a point of fairly honest like how you write it. And I find the best, personally, I found the best to use non, as less formal language. The people tend to get very wrapped up in, well, this is a very formal review. And now I feel very formal in my responses and I would feel bad to give them bad feedback that I hated their thing. So kind of a little bit more casual tone to how you write your survey and how you present your options can then make people feel like, oh yeah, they really do want my honest feedback. Yeah, we got, we'll come to you. Okay, we'll come to you next after this gentleman. Uh, in your experience, because uh, like one of the problems that my team and I have faced several times is that death by survey. 
Yeah. Uh, the client comes to us with way too many questions. Yes. And then we don't really know how to kind of narrow them down to uh, like a acceptable amount. So do you have any tips and tricks and like how much leeway we can take in like narrowing those questions down? Yeah. Um, my first tip was actually it's harder to implement because it's one of those before you get the list of questions thing. The way I work with my dev teams is I try and prepare them with don't come to me with a list of questions. Come to me with your goals. What is it you want me to know? And I, the researcher, will develop the questions. I think my favorite example of that is a, you know, a D game dev coming to me. I'm like, well, I want to know if mission three is hard. What does hard mean? And then I have to do all this kind of digging. I'm like, well, do you mean was combat challenging? Was it more challenging than they expected? Was it hard because they couldn't navigate the level and couldn't figure out where to go and it was too dark? Was it hard because they didn't know what the objective was and where they were supposed to go in that way? Um, and then I end up as a researcher having to backtrack and kind of figure out, okay, what were your intentions with this question? Oh, you want to know if it was more challenging than they expected. Let's find a better way to word it. So one of the ways is like just as you continue to work with teams, kind of set that as an established precedent of come to me with your goals and what you want to know, and I will write the questions for you. Um, I definitely have had multiple situations that you'll just like what you're describing of my dev team comes to me with this laundry list of questions they've prepared for me so handily. And they're like, this is what we want you to ask. And then I have to have the, okay, let's sit down. And that's a great educational opportunity. The more your devs understand survey methodology and what questions can, and most importantly, cannot achieve, it's a really great opportunity to sit down and educate and say, hey, why don't we have a meeting? And I'm going to talk through, here's the survey draft I've come up with, with what that I think will meet your goals. Let's go through the list of questions you provided me and let me explain the ways in which the survey I wrote, I think meets each of those goals in a little bit more compact form. <laughs> I worry. <laughs> um, it's more of an opinion question. Um, no. Oh, Jesus. Uh, sorry. Um, validator questions. We were talking about um, uh, respecting people's intelligence. Uh, so this, is an, this is an interesting question. Do you use those validator questions, the ones that are flipped backward to see if people are screwing the pooch on your survey? Um, and basically, yeah. like, you know, you get the idea. Yeah. yeah. Um, so basically kind of what Matt's talking about is a common technique is like switching which side of your scale, like left or right is positive or, you know, and switching that up within the same survey. I'm sure there will be people who disagree with me. In my opinion, I dislike doing that. I think the chances of people just kind of, they're like, oh, well, I've learned your survey taught me. I've been onboarded into your survey and tutorialized with your survey that left is negative and right is positive. And so I can just go through, I read the text, the question, I keep going. Um, and so I personally dislike that. I think it's mostly because we're working with, I'm usually working with really small sample sizes. And so the risk of one person screwing up left and right as being positive and negative can actually have a decent, decent amount of impact on the data that I'm getting from them. Um, I understand why it's used, especially in larger samples. I prefer to use validating questions that are a little bit more, are you paying attention? I think uh, my favorite one that I've ever seen is like, have you ever been in an accident that resulted in your death? <laughs> uh, just straight up in the middle, like bury that in the middle of your survey. And then you're getting this kind of gut check. Are people paying attention? Are people reading? Um, and so I tend to err on the side of validation questions more along those lines than ones that actually risk harming the data that I'm collecting. What do you do when you find bad data? What do I do when I find bad data? All right. That's a great question as well. Um, one thing I would recommend for that is if you're going to be sending a survey to a large sample size, send a small subset first so you can kind of get like, oh, I want to get feedback from 5,000 players. Let me try and get maybe 200 responses first so I can validate whether my survey is collecting the data I want on a small sample before wasting all of my 5,000 people I'm trying to get. So that's a good place to start is like have that kind of filter in case. And then I'll be like, oh, no, I have bad data in my pool. What have I done wrong that's causing this to happen? Um, other than that, if, you, if it's like in your live survey and you have no ability to go back and fix the problems you created, um, generally I kind of see, is there anything useful? Is it just one question that this person messed up? You know, if it's on a smaller sample, especially because it's super important, every participant counts. Like, is some of their other data still valid? Can I recover at least part of their survey? Um, maybe everything from this point 
in the survey and later is not going to be valid, but can I recover the first half? Um, usually in surveys, especially wide ones, I front load all the really important questions. So if people do mess up or dip out halfway through, I've gotten what's most critical to me. Otherwise, sometimes you just have to kind of say this entire subset of players or participants, I can't trust the data that I've gotten from them. And then you just have to, you know, bite the bullet on that one and be like, I messed up as the person running the survey. I now have a lot of bad data in my data set and I just need to accept that I cannot use this for analysis purposes. It sucks, but you can learn from it. <laughs> Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, earlier you mentioned kind of like an example question, say the developers wanna know, do players find level three to be hard? How do you kind of ask that question without directly asking what you're looking for? Yeah. How, how do you handle that without biasing? The yeah, answers? so one of the things I do in the way I write my questions, um, especially because let's talk video games, I don't ask players, I don't use the word difficult. Difficult carries a ton of baggage with it. People think about difficulty levels and they're immediately thinking about whether or not combat was difficult instead of kind of taking a holistic view of the whole game. Um, they might then also get a little bit into gamer ego of no, I can't admit something was too difficult for me, then I would be revealing myself to be bad gamer. Um, so I like to use different words to try and kind of soften the blow of that. So personally, I like to use the word challenge. Um, and I like to use a pair of questions. I say, how challenging did you find that content? Um, and then how did that challenge level meet your expectations? Um, because one of those alone is not going to give you the information you really want, which was, was this too hard for players? What you want to know is how challenging do they find that? And then if I want to know specifically about combat, I will say how challenging was combat. But I like to leave it kind of I like to, like I said, I just avoid the word difficulty, avoid the word hard, things along those lines. Um, just kind of as you become familiar with working in games, you kind of learn the terms that are likely to um, influence players on like a subconscious level and difficulty is definitely one of them. Thanks. It's kind of a follow-up question, but do you have any question that come into your mind that is often super confusing for players when filling a, a, game, a game survey? Um, I think kind of the one, the difficulty question is one of the ones that I get at the most. It's not, players don't feel confused. They feel like they know exactly what you're asking, but they often are misinterpreting it. Um, I think other ones that can be easily misinterpreted by players, or if you ever try and get anywhere near the, ter the realm of purchase intent or anything along those lines, players immediately get super confused. And they're like, well, I just spent five hours playing this game in your lab. Uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe I went to buy it. Um, anything that's asking them to rate an experience, especially on an unfinished product, is going to be really nebulous. Um, because you as the researcher might intend that I want you to rate the experience you just had as is, but players actually have a very difficult time divorcing that from, oh, well, I know this developer and I have faith in them. This game is going to be good. Or I love this franchise or, you know, I think that when it comes out, um, you also have problems then with people putting on what I like to call the every gamer hat. And they're like, well, it's not the game for me, but I can see other people playing it. So I'll rate it an eight. You're like, I don't, I don't care what you think other people will rate it. I want to know how you feel about it. So I think that that kind of realm of questions is where we really can get into the weeds really fast with players understanding what exactly our intent is with the questions we're asking. All right, no more? All right, sorry, we are done. Thank you everyone for coming. I'll kind of hang out here if anyone else has any questions. <laughs>